Good everything, Nubians. Hello and greetings and non-Nubians and everyone all over the globe. Welcome to episode 175 wow. of In Class with Carr. In Class together. We're together. Karen Hunter creation. And we are all in this nation. And I am so happy to be here as always. Love you. Good everything. Here's My the thing about creation. You know, even if we're talking about the earth in the Big Bang, it needed a catalyst. Facts. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Nobody's creating with themselves, even in the, uh, I guess, nature. I guess they're, they're uh, things that can reproduce without, but they still need certain elements, right? Yeah, you got to rub up against something. No question. Something, something, something got to happen. So something. thank you. Thank you for rubbing up against me. So anyway, um, I, <laughs> look, <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been an interesting week and, and you, you're going to be out there in the streets and um, again, yeah. traveling. Yeah. Yeah, shout out to all the people in Black Lives Matter LA, uh, my sister and comrade Melina Abdullah, all of the folk there. They are they've put together a weekend of um, gatherings and thinking and planning and plotting and surveying and assessing for the tenth anniversary of, I guess, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. So well, was, was yeah. it two years ago that Trayvon Martin was? Well, he was killed. Like as we remember, he was killed in in 2012 All Star Weekend, and then of course uh, George Zimmerman's race comrades and white nationalists. Shout out to Tommy Tuberville. Uh, let him go in 2013, March 2013, and of course uh, that's when uh, it wasn't Opal Tometi. I think it was who was the first of the three who Alicia Garza put her Facebook post out uh, on the seventh, and at the end ended it with. Uh, you know, our, our lives matter, black lives matter. And then Patrice Cullis picked it up and put the hashtag on Twitter. And uh, that was the 7th of March, 2013. So we're a little past the 10 year anniversary. And then Opal Tometi kind of picked up the hashtag theme and built something out, which started as a social media phenomena and congealed into damn near anything you can think of. So, but the, the in-person, one of the in-person elements of it um certainly uh melina was present for the creation she's a long time professor out there in the cal state system cal state la in particular black studies department and um they picked up on it and just used that to continue to synergize and connect with the uh the energy that they were already using to try to build out better possibilities for black folk mm. so uh so yeah they they and they've been consistent regardless yes, of what else is happening I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about how Black Lives Matter, then uh, rally and cry, all lives matter. And then it was Blue Lives Matter. And right. then, you know, it's like the, the way in which we just try to center uh, liberation and fighting for justice turns into uh, offense to some people. And then the need for controversy that follows where, where you, you know, you take individuals and hold them up as the reason why this is corrupt and this is why we shouldn't be following as opposed to leaning into the foundation of a thing which is hey just like the whales are you know going away we want to save the whales nobody's going hey hey what about the guppies <laughs> guppies lives matter hey hey what what about the plankton what about the plankton you know mm. about that we want to save the whales because they're they're under siege right so What's the problem? Like, what is it? And and so I, I I was thinking about this this week, Dr. Carr, on the show, and I was like, what if we created families for liberty? You know, we want freedom, and we're family. Should we should we have a families for liberty movement? You know, I'm and I'm saying something right now, I'm being a little cheeky, but at the same time, you know, I'm so sick of you people, you horrible degenerates. Uh, taking things and and twisting them around because you are uncomfortable with your own inhumanity, because you don't want to fix yourself, because you don't want the world to be welcoming for all. You just want it for your little tribe, your little tiny, recessive, going away, diseased tribe. And I'm talking about in here and in here and your heart and your mind. So gather yourself. Hmm. But yeah, we're family for liberties. We're families for liberty. Yes, I was just thinking about that as we are in the slogan thing. I see people with signs on their, uh, you know, on their grasses. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Carr? I think, first of all, I'm grateful for this um, 
this moment, not just generally, but very specifically what we're talking about right now. Uh, listen very intently and gratefully to your conversation with our friend and brother Cornell West. And uh, I think Cornell, Cornel West would call the devil his sister or brother and find something good to say about Satan. You know, and thank oh, you. Yeah. My, thank you, my dear sister, Satan, my dear brother, Satan, for uh, clarifying for us the uh, the limits and possibilities of good and evil. And because because if you didn't exist, sister, brother, Satan, then somehow we would not be able to deep, deep, move deeply within ourselves to, to, to find that thing that will ultimately vanquish you. So I want to thank you for your service and for even though you are evil, somehow providing the balance that God intended, sister, Satan. But. In the case of in your case, <laughs> when he did, you know, uh, respectfully, uh, obviously refer to you as Professor Hunter from Hunter College and then go on to talk about the invaluable role that you play and have played for a long time and continue to play. He was he, he wasn't just doing what he always does as Cornell, which is finding good in everybody. He was in that case converging with the absolute truth. So I want to I want to thank Cornell <laughs> for, for recognizing that, <laughs> first of all. But, thank, thank a, you know, but it was a fascinating conversation because. I think both of us and all of us who were together last Saturday at BlurredCon, mm -hmm. and then as we unpacked it Monday night in office hours in Nubia, I think I don't see how anyone who was physically there couldn't be moved and struck by the energy of people together for a common purpose who have been organizing and building together in spaces that were digital who get to see each other. It, it was it was it was certainly a shock to me again shout out to brother Reyes because again like you like you said on Saturday this is that that's his that's his central people there but so many Nubians were there and so many people who are in conversation with us on a regular weekly basis were there and so when you talk about you know families for liberty we can't defeat well we could but it might take a little longer when a billionaire like a Ed Bloom or, or somebody writes a check and creates an organization. When billionaires come together and create Moms for Liberty, which is not anything other than a creation of billionaires who fund these people to do this full time. And when the reaction like a Black Lives Matter, which starts as a Facebook post and then two others yeah. get a hold of it and put it online on a platform we don't own, and then it then it has real world implications by you know 2014 with Eric Garner and Mike Brown by 2015 when you know what happened with Freddie Gray in Baltimore and then 2016 Trump comes out who then ignites all this continuing hatred against Obama and blackness but then very quickly that's the same year that the ADOS hashtag emerges quite frankly and so what we see is that these movements <laughs> that start completely digital find their way into the real world. And Saturday, we saw something that we've been doing digitally now for several years and too strong now with Nubia. And here we are, 175th uh, moment in, begun in the middle of the pandemic that brought a lot of that energy into the street after the murder of Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. You have raised a very important question and made a very powerful observation you know do what forms of gathering and organizing and being and moving together can we tap into and do we need to and can we even counter art of completely artificial creations that are well resourced with dollars with the type of work we're doing which is has much deeper roots mm -hmm. into a much longer conversation and ultimately is building in ways that by the time they even get a glimpse of what we're doing it's going to be too late i, I don't know I, i'm just went cuz you asked Cornell a lot of questions yesterday that oh. didn't will be answered so i want to let's talk about and and i didn't ask him a lot of questions no you didn't but you implied them <laughs> so you know i mean it's interesting i'm and, and his way is disarm is to disarm whomever he's with you know it's, it's a tactic right Thanks. and so all i'm saying is i'm not saying it's it's work that i want to do no. But I think there's somebody out there that has endless time because they're not doing anything to construct a families with liberty, families for liberty movement and pour their energy into it. Our energy is in building. Right. And I feel like while there's infinite um, amounts of energy in the universe and we're abundant and energy cannot be created nor destroyed as individuals, we need to focus stolen focus being a book. I recommend. Thank you, Dr. Carr for introduce, introducing it into our lives. And it and is. Thank you. I also got to thank you. So many black people reading that book. Now, every time I look around, I see somebody say, I'm just like, I, now I'm reading. 
okay, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry, I mean, yeah, I mean, saying, if, wow. if, if, if we're focused on the goal, right? There's some of y'all just be yap, yap, yap. And if you're going yap, 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 do that. Do the do the, the liberty thing. And let's counter that because some we got to do all of the things. We're in war. We got to do some guerrilla tactics. We got to do some, you know, organized tactics. All of the things, I think, because, you know, I feel like our, our failure has been in thinking that the battles won were the wars won. And they were just battles, Fair. right? And what other people understand is these battles, you know, take time. They got a long vision since the Civil War, you know, since all of the insurrections that got put down that right. we don't even talk about. We talk about John Brown and, and Denmark Vesey and them, but we don't really talk about all of the little ones that, that sparked it and even before Nat Turner. But they have never given up this notion of, you know, ultimate power, enslaving in whatever form, whether it's imprisonment or what have you, other people for power's sake. And it's, you know, if we're always on our heels fighting and never on the offense, then I feel like it, it's not a fair war. So somebody got to be offensive out there. Now, I know, you know, maybe I may be built for the offense, <laughs> you know, but there are other people too. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be on offense personally. I'm ready to bust you in your mouth right. at every turn and knock you upside your head verbally and, and, and use every, um, you know, keep you on your heels. I mean, we, we're constantly having, well, what about black lives? You know, we're, we're fighting the insane, right? This insanity, what we're in right now. No and then we even have to like, please see me, please value me. You know, you got Neil deGrasse Tyson out there. I don't want to be a black astrophysicist. I just uh, who? another very insightful conversation. Yeah. <laughs> of course, with his and, and how many was that? That was in our first year. We talked about his father, Cyril deGrasse Tyson. And and as we showed a couple of books he wrote uh, when he was dealing with the version of Harry Act in New York, in Newark. And talking about these model cities and all this black power. And then, of course, we saw his character introduced in Godfather of Harlem, it, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's father, serving as a counterweight to Malcolm and Bumpy Johnston and them and saying, I got to stay away from Adam Clayton Powell. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson comes by it honest. I thought it was a very important conversation you were having because when you don't have institutions, you don't have counterweights, then you have no choice but to be absorbed in that. My biggest issue in addition to what he said, was where he said it. Of course. And I'm like, why are y'all running over there making that person more, you know what I'm saying? Who's like Darth Vader sitting behind a camera. I'm just like, we we got to do different things, Dr. Carr. We just got to, and we are doing different things. So I'm not, and you know, I'm not that lamenting right. that there are things being done because there absolutely are things being done. But collectively, we need to be really mindful about where we spend our time, who we spend our money with, mm -hmm. what we click on, what we read, you know, who we communicate, who we're in community with, right? Because you are not just what you eat, but birds of a feather, right? So if all you're around is ratchet, ridiculous ass people who are not serious, then you're a ratchet, ridiculous ass person who's not serious. Wow. Or you can certainly be recruited into becoming one. Well, I mean, all I want to do is take chains off. All I want to do is take chains off. But, I mean, but that <laughs> that, that mantra, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. we're at a low point now. Shout out mm -hmm. to the anniversary of hip hop. But but that that mantra then becomes the organizing logic and survival becomes the center. And that's not what we're doing. And that's, we're not the first to do it. We're not the only ones to do it. But we're contributing to the solution. And, and it does... It, I think there are two rewards. We know one reward is being in community. This is the this is the essence of governance. When we were together Saturday, mm -hmm. and as we said on Saturday at BlurCon, here go thousands of people from all over the country, some of them outside the country, dressed in every conceivable costume, expressing themselves in every conceivable way. Uh, throw throw away the word intersectionality. If whoever you are showed up and everybody was cool with it, and in that moment. Yeah, we don't own the hotel. No, we didn't. We don't own, you know, but we own ourselves and we are in community. And in that space, the possibilities begin to emerge. We want to be like this all the time. But in this moment, we are being like this. And so I think when we think about that in the context of, of the issues being raised, you know, Cornell, as Cornell told you and told everybody listening, you know, I'm doing this because I'm running to be the head of the empire to dismantle the empire. Well, of course, that's absurd. But but 
but but he but he grapples with absurdity in the way as you said if you so you you spend your time doing that you talk to karen hunter and then you go on msnbc and cnn and you go talk to jared ball and them on black power media and then you go talk to the revolutionary uh marxist and socialist and nationalist and, and talk to everybody and you rough prep meanwhile we're building spaces so that you can say whatever you want and be whoever you are in a space we control that's the essence of governance and what's crazy is he was in this space yeah and, and, you know he he's got a couple of uh sessions uh in very in Nubia, you know very early um, that's right so so i mean you know as, as you're talking and i just want to again thank you reyes for inviting us to this Absolutely. panel uh we're gonna have a bigger platform and a bigger footprint next year and as i was sitting there my wheels were spinning which is why it is important <laughs> to be around people you that's know right. when i got out of that you know in my drive back to jersey I came up with five ideas that will be implemented over the next uh, several years. Reyes is uh, tapped in, you know, I'm like, when Sayada dropped that, and I'm not even going to say what it is, when she dropped that that um, very salient observation about our proclivities and why we don't know where we come from, I was like, we uh, every child coming up in the next several generations will know origin stories like no right. one else. And it's our responsibility to not just be happy to be invited to other people's origin stories, borrow from our origin stories, because <laughs> that's really what it is. You know, we are like, yes, we're dressing up. And what was wild to me, Dr. Cars, most of the people in the room dressed up as other things, didn't even know that there were other things before these things that they were dressing up uh, right. as that actually look just like them. I was like, wow. And, and they, I didn't know either. So let well, me. I think, well, no, I think that that's one of the that's one of the things that we contribute to providing. We can we contribute to providing. Information. We we contribute here in Nubia to and, and with narrative to connecting people. Because if. Any among the thousands who were at blurred kind and for those who didn't hear uh brother uh Ureas talk about this or us talk about it in a, in a kind of refracted way being led by him you know the black nerd conference which was back in person for the first time since COVID hit in 2020 well you know we you know those who would come into this space come into the narrative space and having in newbie conversations you would be aware of they would be aware of the origin stories and would be able to do deeper dives um the uh second convening of the teaching cohort and it's much greatly expanded now who will be offering the advanced placement african-american studies course uh just wrapped up meeting yesterday here in washington dc on campus Harvard university shout out to all the teachers uh, shout out to all the teachers from last year who came, you know, I saw uh, Velma and my man Emmett and all the homies from New York. Shout out to Queens. Y'all know who you are. I ain't trying to out y'all like at that point just right now, but maybe I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But, you know, those as those teachers were gathering, you know, again, with the curriculum that the, Af the AP African American Studies course laid out, uh, shout out to the uh, to the college board, uh, Sister Brandy and uh, Brother Steve uh, Bumbao and all the crew at um, College Board and Advanced Placement who are doing this work. I want to, you know, we were having conversation and you know, my thing is, it's all very important. It's all very necessary. And I'm grateful to be in dialogue with those folk, with continuing to be in conversation with them and to think about and think through some of the challenges that are related to teaching and learning about our history and culture so to speak and uh you know black lives matter 10th anniversary so i put my black history matters shirt on not because i necessarily am a fan of black history matters like as such i you know but since it's black lives matter 10th anniversary and la is leading kind of having this convening uh this is this is one of the uh the official shirts from the national afro-american uh, history culture center history center there in Wilberforce where we were back in in May Memorial Day weekend but as we were having this conversation about this curriculum again for the second year with some master teachers my man Larry Miles out of Atlanta um, in fact I was so glad to see Larry 
Larry has just written a book, Dr. Miles, um, Afro and Indigenous Intersectionality in America as Nomen, Intersectionally Black. And Miles is Miles is a wild dude. It's very interesting. He teaches in the Atlanta Public Schools and also uh, in the Atlanta University Center, Clark Atlanta. You know, Larry, a long time. He was one time the president of the Southern Region of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, ASCAC. But it, as we were having conversations, I saw him yesterday on campus. And as we were talking, and even just the general conversation around his curriculum, you know, some of the pushback that we see, and I think I mentioned this book before, an excellent compendium of, of some choice documents in Black history in the United States. Um, our history has always been contraband in defense of Black studies. Uh, Colin Kaepernick and my friends and comrades, Robin D.G. Kelly and Kayanga Yamada Taylor. Um, the conversation we were having, you know, there's a tension between those who would say that when you write an advanced placement course for high school, when you write a course on Af ostensibly on Black studies, and let's be very clear, I don't consider what they've done Black studies. And I've been, I have been, you know, I don't need to go out and broadcast that because for me, Africana studies must be, and I think for us, it has to be the study of Africana wherever you find it and through frameworks that come out of what Jacob Carruthers would call the deep well of Africana experiences and thinking and memory. And so you don't borrow Western disciplinary frameworks and black them up or fight to get in or somehow try to say us too, or say we resist. No, resistance can't be the center of your existence. If that's what ends up happening, you just become a figment of whoever is trying to oppress you, repress your imagination. So let me just be very clear, it's not Africana studies, but it is a point of entry to have the conversation, which is where I'm going with this. So when you look at any curriculum, really, dealing with our people, where you start, what Sunyata, Dr. Amin, raised on Saturday at BlurCon as our origin story is very important. Origins are important, but origins are not important just because they place you at the head of the human line. This is a big misperception. This is what allows our open enemies to fight and say, you know, who cares who came first? Who cares whether it's 1776 or 1619 or 1528 or 1526 when the Spanish came over here? Who cares? Because really what we're dealing with in all of those instances, and again, we read Jacob Carruthers' Science and Oppression and discussed it uh, pretty extensively. And when we come back with the Afro class, the Introduction to African Studies class in the fall here in Nubia, we're going to go back and make some adjustments. But that's one thing we're going to keep. Jacob Carruthers talks about those ordinal classifications. The West sets up this basically competition over numbers and rankings. And so the fight is, you know, to see whether you can move your date in as the date. But what never gets discussed is the actual date itself and the concept of dates. Because to me, 1776 and 1619 and 1526, and they're all the same date. They're all the same date. Why? Because those four numbers are going to trace back to a zero that is arbitrarily placed. And beyond that, they're setting up an ordinal classification that leads us to be competing over who was the first. This is the first Negro to clean the toilet in the White House. This is the first Negro to make a brick that was laid into the foundation of the White House. This is the first Negro to look over there and say, we could build a White House over there. This is the first Negro who got put on the boat to come over here to say, you know what? We could build a White House over here. This is the first Negro who sold the other Negro who got on the boat who came over to say, yo, we could build a White House over there there who then built the first brick who put the first brick in the foundation to build the house that the first person could go into and clean the toilet and the first is the issue not all those sequential things but the first this is what jay Chris calls an ordinal classification you have allied and anchored yourself and allowed yourself to be informed by a structure that you can never escape being at the bottom of because it's a top-down structure and you're fighting over numbers so part of diversity, equity, and inclusion becomes not that you want to transform the whole society, but that you just want 12% of the 1% to be black, which is what Adolf Reed's critique of the 1619 project was, which I think was unfair. But ultimately, when you ask Cornell West, why are you running? The first question you ask, why, Professor Hunter? And he gives, you know, I'm, I'm running for president so I could be the head of the empire to dismantle the empire. Well, that's an ordinal classification. Have you not, by conceding to the structure reinforced the structure because you made a very salient point when he started naming Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Joe Baker and all he's, he's a Christian. But yet none of them was politicians. And that's what you said. So wouldn't it be better to do it from the outside coming back to the point, which we never left. Ella Baker, 
and Marvell Cook critiquing how black women were treated in the basic neo-slave markets of New York as they went to become domestics and, and go clean up white women's houses. Ella Joe Baker, who joins the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and who gives advice to the young people who formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Martin King coming out of the black church tradition and the black segregated uh, neighborhoods of Atlanta. Going to uh, the Atlanta University Lab School with his sister Christine, who will be funeralized this Saturday and Sunday in Atlanta. Those of you who are around, as we talked about last week, hope you can go make those rituals. One of which start is today. I think she's laying in state today at the Legacy Chapel at Ebenezer. Uh, the King family, who, um, in fact, it's so funny. I got in the other room. Maybe we'll talk about it on Monday night because uh, thinking about you know who's left from that generation. Well, you know Adam Daniel Williams King, A.D as he was known, who died in an unfortunate accident in a pool shortly after his brother uh, was assassinated, Martin. A.D.'s wife is still alive, and she wrote a memoir. I was rereading it in the other room that night. But my point is this. They all came out of Black institutions. They were not politicians. Andrew Young was not yet a politician. Story for another day. The point is this. You are trying to dismantle something because it is oppressing you and really hurting all of our common humanity. But the attacks on those things, the things that allow us to fight from them, we fight from them best from positions of strength, from the institutions that we control, we own, that we build. We're not in a competition to become the first Negro to do this, the first one. Anytime you start talking about the first one to do this, the first one to do that, you've accepted the ordinal classifications and, and, that's, and that's the problem. And uh, that's right, Atasha, a structure is never dismantled from the top. We need to get it to foundation, which is bigger and stronger than the top of the structure. Right. And while it is important to have policymakers and have people within the mechanism fighting to get that pressure off of us, that kind of all I want to do is take chains off mentality. You can tell I'm not a huge fan of the, the current iteration. Much, much of it is some of it I like, but the stuff that makes it to the ears of our young people consistently because the market is picking winners and losers by what they can profit on and algorithms. That stuff I find a little bit more difficult to to, to obtain to kind of kind of get with. I'm going to tie this together in a second. The the challenge of institution building is something that we take on every day with the choices we make, as you said, Prof. Let's pause and think about this. What does it mean to build governance formations? In the conversation we were in this week with the teachers and with the folks who put together the APF from Make States course, and we've talked about this. If you don't, if you want to get a good sense of how, you know, we've kind of talked about this advanced placement course that was making a lot of headlines last year and over the last year plus, then you can go back to the narrative archive and kind of go through and see how we talked about it in detail. I'm not going to do that right now and no need to do it. And plus, it's not really where I want to go. The conversation emerged, many of the critics including my man Robin Kelly in the introduction to this new book, Our History, has always been contraband, which, again, I say is an excellent compendium of um, materials. Um, but again, one among, in a long line. You know how many anthologies of Black writing we have, some of which were published by Black people? I mean, Carl G. Woodson, The Mind of the Negro, uh, in the letters that were written during the 19th century, big volume, Black published um, I mean, anyway, I could talk about Howard Bell. I mean, any number of anthologies. This adds to and extends the tradition of writing. Most of this is primary documents. It's good anthology. But Robin writes a, uh, an introduction on racial justice, black history, critical race theory, and other felonious ideas. Um, it's very interesting. He says, when the college board released the final curriculum 11 days later, he's talking now about the whole thing about whether DeSantis influenced it and you know, this kind of thing. It had changed substantially. Most of the material in the Florida Department of Education found offensive was removed or downgraded from mandatory to optional topics. Let me be very clear. When you read, and, and, and no, go back and look at, I'm not going to argue with this. This is not even the point I want to make. Go back and look at the narrative thing. We went through that. Or better yet, go to the college board. Uh, uh, what do I do here? Maybe I have, thought I had a copy. Yeah, I got a couple of these. Um, just go, go to the college board thing and download the curriculum and read it for yourself. Don't believe what people say about stuff if you can get to the documents. Anyway, the revised 234 page curriculum eliminated queer studies, critical race theory, mass incarceration, and a section entitled Black Struggle in the 21st Century. Again, not going to argue. This is where I'm going. 
made the Black Lives Matter movement and reparations optional research projects. By the way, the research project is mandatory, but I'm not going to, again, argue with that. There I am arguing with it. Let me just stop. This is where I'm going. Hmm. Expanded its coverage of ancient African history and added units on Black conservatism, Afrofuturism, blah, blah, blah. The point is this. Expanded the coverage of ancient African history. Ooh, it's right there at the back of my teeth. I'm going to pause here and censor myself and make this point. Somewhere. The smartest Negroes in America. Well, he'll establish academics. Brilliant fighters for black liberation and against white supremacy and anti-racism. Somehow they, somewhere, somebody got the the idea that the study of deep African time and space is no threat to white supremacy. On the ignorant social media influence completely spun around in space and now disoriented, repeating whatever they heard said, end of the black spectrum, they call it the hotep critique. On the other end of the black spectrum in our governance space is the well-heeled, usually Ivy League or Ivy adjacent, well-published and feted and rewarded end. They say, studying ancient Africa is fine, but how do we solve the problems here? That, that has nothing to bear. Okay, here's the challenge. That's why I say this stuff not black studies. Africana studies and those who are in Nubia, who are consistently in conversation with Dr. Beatty and all the folks studying Middle Nature on a weekly basis, by the way, without a doubt, without any comparison, and then I invite anyone even sampling any of this conversation anywhere in the world to compare any course of study in Middle Egyptian language and its connections, its grammar, its logics, its uh, ability to grasp heavy conceptual uh, uh, issues and heavy conceptual ideas, heavy ideas, and bring them forward to kind of contemporize them. I defy anyone, or I invite, defy is the wrong word. I don't want to be combative about this. I invite anyone to compare any conversation anywhere in any form as it relates to Egypt, ancient Egypt. I invite you, invite you. That, in, that includes Professor Henry Gates, uh, who has of late been inviting a number of folk into his venue and, and into his space. Uh, the cat who we talked about uh, in year one of in class, we talked about his book on Nubia. Uh, this is the latest production to have been energized by those kind of resources in the Ivy League. Christopher Eret, Ancient Africa, a Global History to 300 CE. I, you know, if you want, if you got three, four dollars, you want to buy that, fine. But I wouldn't put this at the top of my list. I'd get Theophilo Bingo first. When we go to Kemet at the beginning of August, you know, that debate has already begun to walk through this. He did some of that work on Tuesday. Eret finds a way to evade every black scholar who has written and thought about this issue, who would somehow displace his, uh, to use Mario's words, Christopher Columbus approach to figuring out that ancient, you know, <laughs> that ancient Africa is important. Let me be very clear about this. Let me just, I don't want to get too far of it. And I'm just going to show you this. This is a, this is a six chapter book. Um, it, he, he thanks uh, Henry Gates for inviting him to the Hutchins Center at Harvard for making, uh, for a series of lectures, the Nathan Huggins lectures would serve to, as the spur to write this book. The sixth chapter, African, uh, six chapters, African first in the history of technology chapter. Uh, I'm sorry. Number one, introducing the issues and themes where he basically frames the issues. African firsts in the history of knowledge, then ancient Africa and the export of agricultural innovation, then towns and long distance commerce in ancient Africa. But the chapter we want to focus on, this is the one that uh, Dr. Beatty has us focusing on now. Chapter five, the Africanity of ancient Egypt, the deep background of ancient Egyptian history, 20,000 to 6,000 BCE, the not so deep time story of Egypt's foundations, 6,000 to 3,100 BCE. See, when you write it, this is Charles Finch's newest book, as I mentioned, uh, Nile Valley Civilization, 10,000 year history, shout out to Mama Nia and Medu Bookstore in Atlanta, where we went and picked up our copies of it. 
when you write it, you're a crank. You're a hotel. You are, uh, uh, oh, boy, here we go with them fuzzy hats. And here we go. Da, da, da. Now, of course, when you draw inspiration from it, it becomes Afrofuturism. Shout out to our brother, um, Dr. Kevin Strait, who joined us at the Blurred Con, who uh, uh, who Urias recruited to be on the panel with Karen, with you, me, and, and Sunyata, and the Afrofuturism exhibit, History of Black Futures at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, very much inspired by ancient and medieval Africa. And as we talked about on Saturday, inspiration is important, but it's a point of entry for deeper study, which is where I go with this. So when you write about it, and you Charles Finch, you're a hotel. When the museum puts together an exhibit with Sun Ra and Earth, Wind and Fire and all the stuff and Black Panther, all drawing inspiration from the Egyptian, uh, the, the kind of ancient African kind of thing, but not really getting too deep into the study, but getting some of it. I mean, after all, Maurice tried to tell y'all white, it's written in the stone, but I mean, you know, it's kind of respectable, but it takes the white man, your master, it takes your master to talk about deep time for it to be accurate. After all, that's what affirmative action is, right? Somehow you might be able to get close enough to get into Harvard and touch the hem of the garment of, see, what's the white man talk about it? Oh, I sound like Malcolm tonight. Let me relax. He's allowed to talk about deep time. The deep background of ancient Egyptian history, 20,000 to 6,000 BC. Finch, Thibalo Benga, Shake Out the Job, somebody else, Ben, ben Yakin and John Henry Clark, who made transition 25 years ago this week, July 18th, 1998. John Henry Clark joined the ancestors. When they write about it, they hotel and cranks. When the white man write about it, well, then Princeton University Press comes calling and says, uh, would you like to publish that? And the irony is, that we're not mad at this cat. You know how I know we're not mad? Because he's finally now going to say what he's known all along. But since the governance thinkers were doing this work, since every week for a couple of years in Nubia, Mario Bailey has been teaching and learning Medu Nature to alongside teaching Medu Nature to folk who are learning it by the thousands now. A couple of hundred of us going to be in the Nile Valley continuing that work, just like BlurCon. People got to see each other for the first time. People going to Kemet in person who have been studying together for a couple of years now going to be reading off the walls and really blow the minds of the people in the Nile Valley, which ain't even the reason we're going. We're not going to fight with anybody in the Nile Valley. We're going to connect with our ancestors without interpreters, which is what we're doing. But we're not mad at Eret. Because you, sir, are saying things we've been saying for a very long time. And to show you that we're not mad, one of the baddest Egyptologists around, one of our family, Sistrin. Yeah, they got some black women Egyptologists. One of them is Solange Ashby. Shout out to her children and to her partner, Steve uh, Bumbau. Yeah, the same Steve Bumbau who uh, this is the college board. See, y'all don't know. Y'all can't see black people, and we ain't trying to get you to see us. Uh, I ain't mad at you by you, Barbie. I'm just saying, you can't, I'm with you, sis. You can't, you can't see us. Solange Ashby, Professor Ashby, Dr. Ashby got a quote on the blurb on the back of his book. Solange says, this magisterial book presents Africa's history from our earliest fully human ancestors, the African kingdoms of the first millennium, discussing along the way the independent invention of ceramics, agriculture, cotton weaving, iron smelting, and monotheism in Africa. Eret's volume restores Africa to its rightful place in global history. That's the kind of thing you do so that when you're around in social structure spaces, they don't put you out immediately. But Solange Ashby is bad, particularly in Nubia. Shout out to her. Shout out to Deborah Hurd. Shout out to the founders and the practitioners, including Dr. Beatty, of the William Leo Hansberry Society, my man Justin Dunavit, all them. See, we got governance formations. When you have a governance formation, you can write a blurb on the back. You can be nice and charitable to a guy who is a major figure in the study of Africa and classical Africa who's trying to nurture and keep alive his, according to Theo Benga and others, wrong-headed linguistic uh, exercise to maintain himself as an authority. And how does he do it? In the footnotes, he don't quote none of them people like Obenga because he know what it is. Dr. Eret, we know you know what it is, but it ain't even the point. When you look at a curriculum then, 
Well, then the critics who say, yeah, they took out all the other stuff, which they didn't, but I'm not going to argue about that. Again, go back to narrative and go and look at the, the section where we talked about that actual curriculum. If you read the curriculum for yourself, you ain't even got to look at that. Go look at yourself. But the critics who would say, yeah, them Florida people was mad at the critical race theory. They mad at intersectionality, but they allowed ancient Africa to state, did they? Did they? Do they? It's one thing to just talk about temples and tombs and pyramids. To say Hotep, to say Anku Jasenev, which is an advance because we're getting to learn the language. It's quite another thing to anchor ourselves and gain by gaining the momentum of memory. It's even one thing to talk about Afrofuturism without a deep engagement with the Afro part. It's quite another thing or an extension of those things because all those things are positive or should be seen as positive. It's an extension of those things to finally be in conversation. Those people who are studying understand. We're not studying the ancient African past in order to go back to it. You think we can go back to the past? Really? Okay. Well, that's not what we're doing. Go watch Black Mirror or something if you, you can do that. Which is fantastic. But that's a TV show. Solidarity with the writers, by the way. And the writer strike and everything going on. A lot of casualties mounting up, but you know, the point is this. When you we're not doing that to put on pyramid t-shirts and wear aunt rings, although I wear aunt rings, shout out to Baba Rafu and all the jewelers, you know. Um, but we are studying it to understand what those who preceded us understood about the nature of life and reality so that we can draw from those understandings some form of problem solving that will enhance our lives in the living now. People say, that sounds all good, but you know, why we got to do that? Well, every time I look up and somebody like my friend and brother Cornell West say that he want to restore the best in American democracy, I'm like, why are you starting with American democracy? When was that ever a thing? In fact, when was democracy ever a thing, bro? Can we talk about my eye? Oh, here come one of them hotels. Do you even know what my eye is? You know, my eye cannot be reduced to several adjectives, truth, reciprocity, justice, balance. No, no, no. Go begin to study the language. And understand how this concept translated into everyday living, not just as an individual and as a family but, or community, but as a broader network of human social relations that allowed us to organize to scale. Christopher Eret then wrote about it now. The white man told, it's okay, it's okay. And he started in 20,000 BCE. So now you can kind of put aside, since your master said, it's okay. Because, you know, we say it, you know, it's, no. Mm -mm. So, <sighs> it reminds me of that, was it, most deaf? When you start doing it, it's something well. When I start doing it, it's suspect. It was in his song, Mr. N-Word. N-Word, N-Word? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, anyway. When you start doing it, it's cool. When I start doing it, it's a problem. Well, I don't care what you think about whether I start doing it or not. All right, let me, again, keep this tight because I want to draw some conclude, uh, kind of connections here on the 10th anniversary as LA gets ready to celebrate, or mark, rather, the 10th year, because I don't know how you celebrate. In fact, it's not a celebration as much as it is a recognition of what we've done and what remains to be done. To be critical, to be celebratory, all those things are folded in. But the reason we even build out courses of study is so that we can collectively begin to listen to our ancestors without interpreters. That's Jacob Carruthers, the first pages of Met Meta Nature, his book, Meta Nature. You know, we must break the chains. All I want to do is take chains off. All I want to do is take chains off. Okay, take chains off, bro. I've heard you repeat it now 150,000 times on this auto-tuned uh, thing that they've now released. So that's all this is in my mind. Now that you've taken the chains off, we got to break those chains. And Jacob Carruthers said, you got to break the chain that links your ideas to ideas that are really kind of dead end as it relates to problem solving for anybody in the human community. And listen to your ancestors without interpreters. That's how you study the language. As you're listening to your ancestors without interpreters, you won't frame things all the time as you're trying to restore the best of American democracy. And Brother Cornell was talking about, you know, Martin Luther King and Van Lou Hamer and all them. And then he dropped a little John Cole train in. I mean, it's all very brilliant. My thing is, but why you started in 1776 or 1787 or 1619 or 1865 or 1965? Why are you in that ordinal classification? Break those chains and listen to your ancestors without interpreters. And what you will understand is that Mrs. Hamer 
Redeemer is working in an ark that goes back thousands of years. Christopher Rett might even say now, the white man said it, 22,000 years. Who knows, you know? But your master said it, so it's okay now, I hope. And if it isn't, that's fine too, because if you listen to your master, that's the first problem you have, just like ordinal classifications. The point is this. Whether it be an advanced placement course for high school students, whether it be a quote unquote informal space like BlurCon, or whether it be what we're doing here in Nubia, which is joining what we've been doing for a very long time since the beginning of humanity, but as we have found ourselves in this asymmetrical war that was declared on us about 500 years ago, that has, that where a truce has never been declared, where any advancement we've made has been in spite of attempts to either confine us, reconfine us, or engage in what Barbara Fields and them may call racecraft in a way to keep people oppressed, class relations, all that, the stuff Cornell is talking about and wanting, wants to end. We have always built those spaces where we can hear our voices and hear our ancestors without interpreters and use that to fortify our struggles in the present and also to live more fully. So whether wherever you're doing it, it's important to do it. The, the idea that somehow the study of the deep African past is no threat to contemporary conditions, I started to say, mm -mm, mm -mm, is... That's a miss. That's a missed opportunity. I'm uh, part of my. I, we know this. Those you study Egyptian language. Let me give you a very concrete example of how this will work, even in conversation in real time. You know, when people say, "Well, in my book, or in my thesis, or in my," I argue that I argue that. Hold on, hold on. That language of argument, that language of that language of contention, that language of critique, kritos from the Greek, kritos to know through. You know, this kind of form of of combativeness. Hold on. Maybe we can approach this in a different way. Cons people talk about building consensus. Well, if you study in my eye, you know that consensus building is not, you know, new. But the whole idea is that you've got to come from a space that says we're trying to build community. That is our logic. That's the logic of my eye. That's the logic, even in fact, in the Odu Ifa. That's the logic, as as, uh, as Sunyata was talking about on Saturday. The whole notion that our origin stories, our grounding logics, the listening to our ancestors without interpreters, give fortifies us with ways of knowing that other category, that third category in our Africana studies framework, with ways of knowing that will allow us to strengthen the governance formation, the second category, which is who we are to each other. And through that strengthening and living and working, we can then push back social structures that are anti-human. So understand that, you know, trying to fortify and strengthen American democracy. Okay, brother, leave America aside. That should be easy. Let's go to democracy. Why you keep using that word? I understand the logic because everybody's heard the word, but you know the demos, the, and you know it better than most folks because you studied those Near Eastern languages at Harvard and you weren't there for affirmative action, regardless of what white people say then and now. But the point is that you studied very deeply. So you know that the Greeks never had what you call a democracy. It was very classist. It was very sexist, all that thing. And we had people as enslaved, including Aesop. So you don't want to really use the word democracy, do you? I get it that you're fascinated with the Greeks. And yes, set aside Plato and Aristophanes, set aside, you know, set aside uh, Thales and Anaximander and all them people that Theophilo Binga 30 years ago debunked as having the source of origin of any of this stuff that they claim is Greek. And I guess Christopher Arrett will get there as soon as he can figure out some white people to cite so he ain't got to cite Obinga. But the point is this, the Greeks had multiple gods, but as the justice system said in their... Uh, in their hip hop song, 50th anniversary hip hop coming up, so this is about 40 years ago, dedicated to Bambada. He says, The Greeks had multiple gods, but never ciphers. Let's just pause on this. Indeed, Datena, Ubuntu definitely describes our ancestors. Ubuntu in Southern Africa from the Nguni languages, right? Ubuntu, people. Ntu. Ntu is the root of that word. Ntu, the essence. Bantu, Hintu, Kantu, you know, that's, that's stuff Jahan Jahan was writing about 50 years ago in, in Muntu, his book. But, you know, Muntu Dance Theater, Muntu Theater Company. Well, you know, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, Black folk in, this, in the United States of America had a sense of peoplehood and sense of self that knew we needed to draw from them. In fact, there's a new book out on Swahili 
called uh, Morgan Robinson's book. I think I showed you a language for the world, the standardization of Swahili. One of the one of the one of the reasons why black folk were searching for um, a common language. Notice I didn't say again concepts lingua franca. A common language so that we could use whatever local languages we had, regional languages we had to communicate with each other past that. People do that all the time. In fact, the only time the idea of common forms of communications and networking are seen as a threat is when the West can't do it. English is the language of commerce for the world. Well, let's let's identify one. Could it be housing in the West, Swahili in the East? Here we go, them damn Afri. Y'all ain't Africans ever. Okay, well, but you use English everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You use the dollar everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, until maybe the end of the, in August when they meet at the BRICS conversation because y'all saw they, they want to move now to a, a common trade currency. And who's screaming bloody murder? Everybody. Joe Biden, they had the House Financial Committee meeting and the Democrats and the Republicans. Ranking member on the House Committee was, doc, uh, was Sister Joyce Beatty, who immediate past chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. She sound like the Republicans. Got to worry about the dollar is strong. We got to protect the dollar. <sighs> so democracy is a word, you know, okay, fine. Use it because we all know the word, but don't use it exclusively. Also build by listening to your ancestors to come back because the Greeks never had democracy to help everybody. The Greeks are built on what Jacob Carruthers and Metanetra calls the fun, what does he call it? The, uh, Alienation. In fact, he writes a chapter in Metanetra called The Metaphysics of Alienation, meaning what? Conflict, contesting. We got to argue, but you can argue in a cipher, in a, in, in a circle. You ain't got to argue by saying, I'm going to kill you, Hercules. I ain't going to, you ain't got to argue by saying, I'm going to eat you, children. Who are you? I'm Kronos. Well, why you, well, the Greeks had multiple gods. You say, Y'all have, well, yeah, the Greeks had multiple gods. Justice System said in their hip-hop song dedicated to Bambada because the Greeks had multiple gods but never ciphers. In other words, what is the objective? Are we trying to build community here? So when you critique ancient Africa by saying it's no threat, you have revealed that you haven't studied ancient Africa because Africana ways of knowing are the ultimate threat to anti-human uh, social structures. Ask Martin King, who tried his best to pump life into John Donne, who tried his best to pump life into uh, Shakespeare, who tried his best to pump life into the Greeks, but ultimately what show, who tried his best to pump life into Gandhi. But what shone through ultimately was the deep Africanity of his perspectives. That's what allowed him to go in Chicago and sit with the gang leaders in that apartment that they rented, he and Coretta for him, himself, her and the children on the south side of Chicago and sit in that apartment till four o'clock in the morning, night after night after night with gang folk who said, yeah, Dr. King, we can't be for this nonviolence, but we are trying to really grapple with this because ultimately what we're doing is trying to figure out a way to survive. All we want to do is take the chains off. And you know what, brother? We understand why you nonviolent. And that's why we telling you that these Chicago police and your lieutenants can't protect you in the streets of Cicero like we can. You know what Dr. King said? <laughs> Should I agree? So you know who kept Dr. King alive when he was marching through Chicago? The gangs of Chicago. What them boys want? All they want to do is take the chains off. Here's very interesting. Another book I'm reading right now. Forrest Stewart's book. Very interesting. It's called Ballad of the Bullet. So you know where he took this from, Malcolm, right? Ballad of the Bullet. Gangs, drill music, and the power of culture. Infamy. Of online infamy. Online infamy. This whole book, very interesting guy. This guy, Forrest Stewart. I don't know, uh, know the cat. He's uh, he's at Stanford University. I have his other book now, Out and Under Arrest. He is writing about years of study that he did of drill music and those who produce it. Now, what's this got to do with what we're talking about now? I'm going to start tying this together. I'm already tying it a little bit, but I want y'all really walk with me here a little bit. Yes, uh, Onye Dikachi, Martin Luther King and What Manner of Man by Lerone Bennett, where he spoke about cosmic companionship, our we. That's right, companionship. But what Professor Stewart is writing about here, he spent many years in Chicago. He was teaching some, you know, program. He was teaching some programs, teaching young children, connecting through those children to their families, connecting through their families to the older children and friends and family and siblings. And he finds himself ultimately in 2014 after a couple of years of this, 
he finds himself in conversation with one of the more prominent groups engaging in the production of drill music. The CBE, Corner Boys Entertainment, simply the Corner Boys. See, this is a book I, I appreciate for uh, for Stewart Scholarship, but Kim Delaney, Dr. Delaney, I know you in here. If you and I didn't work already at the Dunbar Museum, this is your book to write. In fact, this is the book that Chicagoans, Africans in Chicago have to produce. Even though this is a great book, again, the we, it has to come from the we in a way I think is very important. And I'm just going to mention this very quickly. In fact, let me just read it. He says, on a warm September evening in 2012, 18-year-old Joseph Coleman rode a bike down a tree-lined street on Chicago's south side. A nondescript Ford sedan slowly approached. Without warning, someone inside the car fired seven shots at the young man, striking him as he tried to flee. Pronounced dead at a nearby hospital, Coleman had become the latest victim in the city's infamous gang violence. I first heard about Coleman's death two years later, 2014, during conversations with Chicago teenagers. At the time, I was directing an after-school program designed to help Southside youth cope with neighborhood violence. Coleman's murder was just one of the local shootings they shared with me. The more I dug into the details, however, the more I knew something was different. As I would learn, the attack on Coleman had escalated on social media. Across platforms like YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, over several months, Coleman, an aspiring rapper known as, quote, Lil Jojo, end quote, had been embroiled in an online musical war of words with a rival gang. He had sparked hostilities when he uploaded a homemade music video to YouTube. The grainy footage features the teen and a dozen shirtless friends holding a small arsenal of pistols and machine guns taunting their rivals. Then Coleman uploaded a second video. This one showed him driving through rival gang territory, taunting his enemies through the open window of a passing car. As the death threats poured in, Coleman brazenly advertised his physical location on Twitter, daring his enemies to come find him and make good on their word. Four hours later, he was dead. His rivals had used social media to celebrate the killing, kicking off more rounds of retaliatory shootings that continue to this day. He then goes into how these young cats, under the label of drill, and we know drill is a, is a term for shooting, drill music. It ain't really music. It's an attempt to create a footprint that can ultimately be monetized to help someone improve or families or people improve their, their financial condition. Watch this. He says, of the estimated 45 gang factions in the six square miles surrounding Coleman's Inglewood neighborhood, a staggering 31 of them, roughly 69%, had uploaded one of the, these inflammatory music videos to YouTube by 2016. 2016, by the way, the year, of course, Donald Trump is elected president, the year that uh, ADOS emerges as a social media phenomena, the year uh, that comes after the killing of Freddie Gray in 2015, which was the year that came after the killing of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, these things, the year, of course, that uh, was started, well, July 2014 with Eric Garner with I Can't Breathe. All these things that I'm talking about leading up to 2016, all of them events that come in the long line of attack on Black lives, but because of 2013's emergence of a hashtag, Black Lives Matter, became a way of showing solidarity globally, as we know, with uh, connecting back to the Arab Spring of 2011, so-called Arab Spring, no springtime in that part of the world, but we'll get into, you know, don't even get to talk about that. The point is that all this stuff is, much of this stuff rather, is being generated online with real world consequences by some people who are real world actors, by many, 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 many more who are not, but who are ultimately pulled into these divisions, pulled into these solidarity movements, but the technology is the delivery system. So by the time that uh, Stewart is writing about drill music, he's talking about a condition where people who are living real life struggles in Chicago, chiefly young people, chiefly young men, but also young women and young people generally and their families and the communities they're in are trying to figure out how to be in the world on a survival basis, not, basis, not even dreams, but survival. All I want to do is take chains off. I don't want to do to take the chains off, but instead of being able to break those chains and be in conversation with the deep memory of our people in terms of how you solve problems, even the, the moderately deep memory of when Martin King came to Chicago and had conversations with the gangs who are the grandparents of the gangs that are fighting now on social media and then turning it into real world destruction. Instead of doing that, they keep repeating, all I want to do is take chains off and then figure out if I can do this, as he continues, he says, all of these millions of views, which include, by the way, the, the views of this murder being uploaded, what 
Forrest Stewart says in Ballad of the Bullet is that the ultimate goal, which is to attract eyeballs and clicks and likes and shares, which can then generate revenue and for a handful of people, maybe get them out of the material condition, all of it is an attempt to survive, to take the chains off, to provide some form of relief. And what he says is, he says, at the end of the preface, it's easy to jump to conclusions when we hear voices, stories about teens like Joseph Coleman. We see Brandon, we see Mr. Mayor Brother Johnson in Chicago trying to stop this violence. We see the social structure completely unequipped of understanding why the violence pops off, ready to demonize all of us. We see you, Brother Cornell, running for president to try to dismantle it, the thing from the top, realizing that you're going to be received as a kook. Prophets always are. We understand all of the social structure barriers that if we just spend our time fighting them as our basis of existence, we will play right into the ordinal classification. We understand all that. But what this man is saying is, unfortunately, when we watch videos from groups like the Corner Boys and jump to conclusions, he says, unfortunately, most of the conclusions are wrong. Yes, these young men brazenly celebrate crime and violence, but they're doing it for reasons we don't often consider. That we he's talking about, white academics, petty bourgeois Negroes, and too many of us who are trying to commit some form of what Amakar Cabral or Malana Karinga might call class suicide and say we reject the idea that we are part of a tiny group of Black people who don't want nothing to do with Black people, or we aspire to that. What Eugene Robinson, his book, um, uh, Disintegration, would call the Black elites, who are Black if there's a common threat. But beyond that, don't come over my house. He writes, behind their online bravado is a desperate attempt, desperate attempt to build a better future for themselves, to feel loved, to be seen as someone special. In that respect, they're flocking to social media for some of the same reasons as everyone else. Oh, oh, oh. Man, shit. Watch out now. Mm, mm, mm. They're flocking to social media for the same reasons as everyone else. When we started this conversation, Professor Hunter, when we began this conversation, this iteration, this extension of a conversation you've been having for a very long time, because you live your entire adult life just about in public conversation, attempting to, to absorb, to listen, to repurpose, and then to put back out some form of shifting how we think about ourselves in time and space, to create a better world, whether it be through your written journalism, whether it be through your work in publishing, whether it be through your work in media of all forms, including of late for the last number of years, uh, radio, and then through the creation of this platform and inviting us all in to stand with you in this cipher because we're not Greek after all. The Greeks had multiple gods, but never ciphers to build a community of conversation. We understand that Ultimately, what are we looking for? Build better futures for ourselves, to feel loved, to be seen as special. As we talked about on Saturday at BlurryCon, when the young sister, second to last in conversation, the last person to, and, and you know, thank you, Prof, for seizing the mic and inviting every one of the hundreds that were in that big ballroom. I think you're says 11 floors and in the hotel, they took over everything and I'm walking through shoulders. Should we all trying to get through? I mean, is every floor in this hotel crowded? We just took the stairs to the, to the ballroom floor because, you know, waiting on the elevator was a fool's errand. It's going to take an hour for the elevator to come. But in all that space, then you said, you know, near the end and that they extended us out. Why you said, let me get the microphone. This is a classic Karen Hunter moment. I want to ask the folk here to join in this conversation. It was a beautiful moment. And folk came up one after the other. Many of them Nubians. We talked about everything. And then uh, the, the last sister raised the question of those who don't hear with their ears. Social structure might call them deaf. But of course, you hear with your eyes, you you, you observe, you hear with your nose. I mean, the Egyptian concept of sejim, if you study ancient Egyptian, again, I don't know what Robin, I know what Robin I'm talking about because he never took him out of nature. When you, <laughs> when you understand 
If you understand the broad concept of hearing, which has deep African roots, then you also understand when somebody says you better shut up talking to me or talk to the hand. What they're saying is that I'm giving you several ways to absorb what I'm saying. But the last person who asked the question, of course, didn't hear with their ears. And we were having a great time watching the signers. Right. If you ever seen black signers, you understand how to communicate with more than just even your hands, facial expression, body language, all of it. Brilliant. But the second to last person, his sister got up and asked a question about gender about LBGTQIA, about all these things in a, in, a, in a social structure where the Supreme Court just decided a case based on an imaginary set of facts, which I think is a chef's kiss moment in the continuing uh, uh, unmasking of the illusion of law in this country. You literally took a case on something you made up and decided it. But at the heart of that, of course, was the fear of LBGTQIA. And what the sister said, asked was, you know, how do we find spaces where you know, we're accepted and we confront these questions that we have. I don't use the word misogynoir, like I don't use intersectionality. Again, I'm thinking, what is the ordinal classification at work and what is the ultimate objective? Is this more Greek than African? Because the Greeks have multiple gods, but never Cyprus. Are we trying to build community here? Or are we looking for places so that we feel a little less abused? All I want to do is take chains off. All I want to do is take chains off. I understand that, but who is the we? Are we trying to build a we? So when the sister asked, my response to her was, how do you feel here in this convention with all these thousands of people? Some people who I just take my hat off on a hundred degree day in Northern Virginia, walking around in full fur, like a Wookiee or a werewolf. And you got the helmet. I'm like, aren't you burning up in a minute? And then on the other end of the spectrum, people there who were virtually naked who as, a, <laughs> as an African from a, a grown, born and raised in a certain time in the American South. You know, I, I, I practice the politics of respectability. I'm not ashamed of that. I think we all do. We all have our you know, kind of indices of what it means to be respected. But when I see somebody, well, I'm, wow, I got to look at the sky. It's a beautiful day because <laughs> right now my retinas need to recover. Because, But my point is that nobody felt out of place, which is what we said to that sister. I said, how do you feel? She said, I feel, yeah, I feel good here. I feel, yeah, this is how you should feel all the time. But I don't know that you get there by drawing from intellectual, cultural traditions that have always practiced exclusion. The reason you got to line up, uh, uh, letters as an acronym is because you're living in a society that divides people by identity. This isn't the identity politics that people are trying to critique Black folk for and other people. This is the identity politics that begins with the idea that some people better than other people, and we're going to put a label on those people and keep going in descending order. And that is the roots, I'm sorry, Brother Cornell, of democracy. The demos go to ancient Athens, as Cedric Robinson does in Black Movements in America. But what Boris Stewart says is these boys would prefer not to kill each other. But they're looking, they flock to social media for some of the same reasons as everybody else. They flock to the same for the same reason that Lil Nas X becomes a Barb. And I guess I'll, I don't know. I'm not even gonna say anything about Barbie. But the point is this. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I give Issa Ray, I give Issa Ray prop, I give Issa Ray some credit. They interviewed her. I saw an interview with her the other day, a clip from it. And they said, should you go see Oppenheimer or Barbie? You, how, what, how do you feel about the war? And Issa Rae gave a very African answer. She said, well, I would say go see Oppenheimer for sure. And then come see Barbie after that. And then the person said, well, why wouldn't you say go see Barbie first? Thinking with them ordinal classifications, right? Issa Rae said, well, I mean, after you see, I mean, it's about the bomb, right? It's about killing and murder. He said, you probably want to cleanse your palate. So you want to feel a little bit better. So go see, I understand. Her logic was very African. Now the movies are trash, but the logic was very African. Hey, I ain't going to see Barbie. I might see Oppenheimer because God knows whatever I done paid for, it'll come streaming in the house at one point. But, uh, but if you've read American Prometheus, which is the big book that, uh, Oppenheimer is based on, and y'all know how the feds did Oppenheimer once he said, yeah, I made this bomb, but shouldn't nobody use this. And how did your bomb? Don't even try to do that. It was like, man, give us all your damn clearances. You done lost your damn mind. No, I finally came to the realization that this Western, well, I ain't gonna say, I'm gonna put words in Oppenheimer's mouth, but here's the point. You think the other people in the world couldn't have figured out ways to use technology to kill everybody? The atomic bomb is not a scientific issue. It's a cultural issue. Oh, and Oppenheimer understood, yeah, this thing, because we got to stop these Nazis. But shit, is it, wait, wait a minute. The whole sky could catch, wait, the ball? Oh, slow your roll. It said, thanks, chief. Take it. So I'll go see Oppenheimer at some point, or I'll watch Oppenheimer for some part. Not for the first part when they're building the bomb. That's what the rah-rah people are looking for. No, I'm looking for the second part where they stripped his uh, privileges, took his secret clearances, and then persecuted him, and then he died. Uh, and it's like, yeah, because 
How, you know how many of these scientists become peace activists? Because they done finally figured out that this is a cultural issue, not a scientific issue. Anyway, is are they any different than the boys in the street with drill? No, they all looking for the same thing. They're looking for, again, to repeat, to feel loved, to be seen as someone special, to build a better future for themselves, however they're defining it. And finally, he says, in that respect, they're flocking to social media for some of the same reasons as everyone else. They're just doing it under drastically different conditions. Mm. Conditions that should provoke our consternation more than these young people do. Their online behaviors are inseparable from an offline world scarred by immense structural violence. Somebody in the chat addressed structure. This is what Cornell thinks that perhaps he could take a shot at dismantling from the top. Even as his friend Chris Hedges said, I'm thinking about it, I ain't gonna do it. Yeah, because Chris Hedges is like standing outside the structure and throwing rocks at it and talking about the critique. Cornell, I give you credit, brother. You think you can ride the top of this rocket, but I tell you what, it may be like Dr. Strangelove, that last scene in the movie Dr. Strangelove where the man riding the bomb down to the ground because Oppenheimer built the bomb and couldn't stop it. You think you're going to jump on top of the people, get the nuclear launch codes and tell them you can't put no more uh, weapons in the sky? That's when they put you in, in prison, brother. But anyway, their online behaviors are inseparable from an offline world scarred by immense structural violence like all youth. They're just trying to live their lives within the possibilities and limits of the world we've created for them. So if we bring this into a close, we ask about what kind of world we want to live in. As we talked about last Saturday at BlurredCon, for four days, we were in the world we want to live in. This is the world we want to live in. When Mom for Liberty are created, they want to live in a world they want to live in. It's been created by the social structure they find themselves in. So, you know, Two or three white women with a dollar a piece answer an email, get a phone call from a couple of billionaires. And now it's hundreds of thousands of white women thinking they're fighting for democracy. I think the same democracy Cornell West talking about. Well, the word is so funky that I don't guess everybody can use it. But the point is this that's an artificial creation, but it's tapping into something that's real. It's tapping into racism. It's tapping into this restricted handmaid's tale worldview shared by some people on the Supreme Court, clearly a majority that are able to create their version of a Christian theocracy, or as Cornell would say, a fascist, uh, a fascist structure to prop up something that's dying and collapsing, which is the American social structure. That don't mean that it ain't going to go without pain. That doesn't mean that what comes after is going to be better, but it does mean that it's teetering. And you see in the increasingly desperate acts whether it be a tax mom for liberty on school boards, whether it be a tax on AP African-American studies course that would then have people come in defense of black studies. But here's the problem. The black studies you're talking about ain't black studies. The defense is important, but you done made up a black studies to fight against, which means your whole argument is with the social structure and what we are doing. What the best, I think, of the Black Lives Matter impulse is doing, I'm talking about mutual aid. I'm talking about building spaces where we learn and teach together. I'm talking about some of the things I've seen Melina and them doing out there in L.A., which is one reason I don't mind getting on a plane and going out there and being with them for a couple of days and sitting there in what they call Africa Square. I mean, we were in Congo Square in Philly, Africa Square in New Orleans. They call Africa Square what they call in the social structure, Lamert Park. Where that same Issa Rae film, much of Insecure, shout out to Issa Rae, I ain't mad at Issa Rae, your logic is very African. The application, you in Hollywood, I understand you got to do what you got to do, including be up with them plastic dolls that nobody should be caught dead in their house just because you spray painted one black, don't mean. But the point is this, what we're doing is not just pushing back in defense. The offense we're playing is institution building. And this is where I want to end. We was in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. I was very happy. Um, I, you know, hadn't been there long. And Dr. Reba Kelsey presented me with a copy of this book. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in Office Hours, Voices of the East, Sisterhood, Praises and Reflections, 1969 to 1986, compiled by the East Family Sisterhood Committee. We talked about this in Office Hours, but I hadn't mentioned it in, in, in class. So this is a book of memories and a book, a history book and a book of what they've been doing since of the Cistern of the East. The East was a institution built in the late 1960s. Many of the folk who were participating in the East were school teachers. They had begun work, energized 
kind of as work they had begun before this, but 1968, that the king is killed. And you see a quantum leap, just like in 2020 with the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, and then COVID hits, and then George Floyd is killed. People not, as many people, not as many people are at work, people in their houses, people, and then all those people come out in the streets. So with the, the killing of Martin Luther King is different, but it's similar enough in the sense that this thing overflowed, and for a minute, the social structure got scared. Well, in 1968, the struggle in Brooklyn, the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, the Ocean Hill, Brownsville uh, local school district, Arthur Airway and some others, um, I say Airway because Arthur Eve and others, trying to figure out from the New York Board of Public Education how to have community control. And in that community, those black people said, we want black teachers, we want black history in the curriculum. And that, of course, uh, engendered a fight with the American, uh, with the teachers union, Albert Shanker and them. Now, the unions will fight you back if you're trying to get out from under their thumb. Shout out to the police union, because they always make sure that the police get away from killing, whether it be Darren Wilson killing Mike Brown, whether it be uh, uh, Chauvin, who went to jail. But let's be clear, most people who kill don't go to jail for killing black people unless you're black. Now, at that point, you're going to jail forever. I mean, again, Stewart is, is good on that. But Baba Jitu Weusi, former Leslie Campbell, one of the main teachers in the Ocean Hill Brownsville struggle as they tried to struggle for community control and black history in the curriculum and all that. The sisters raised him up. Here's Baba Jitu. I love that brother. Leslie R. Campbell, renamed Jitu where you see, meaning big black. Six eight, because all his massive love and energy, his heart, he's six foot eight inches tall. Big dude. Every time I would see Baba Jitu, he said, ah, here's the man from Philadelphia. I was a young boy at that time. Just to be included in those conversations with those long distance runners is something that I take very seriously and bring to this space because there are many of us in here who have just those similar stories. And again, we're in a cipher, we're in a community building. But these sisters participated in building what Baba Jitu and others put together called the East. The East was affiliated with a number of things. They had newspapers, Black News, for example. They had uh, the African American Students Association founded in 1967. Black News was the uh, newspaper founded in 1969. Uh, they then rented a physical space, the East facility, and created a bookstore, Akiba Maku. That's February 1970. They're building. This is around the same time that Vincent Harding and them, uh, remember we talked about in 1968, the King Center was in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago. Vincent Harding starts the Institute of the Black World with Stephen Henderson. And then you see Joyce Ladner and... Uh, uh, Jeanetta Cole and so many others joined that formation. Uh, Walter Rodney, so many others. The East creates the East Kitchen. They're feeding people. The Uhuru Sasa. This is their freedom school. This is the school, the Uhuru Sasa. They have the Black Solidarity Political Party, the Evening School of Knowledge, the East Printing Service, the Universal Temple of Thoughts, the African Youth Village. The committee to elect respons responsible candidates, a clothing co-op, a black national education series. Understand uh, uh, whether it be Sonny Rollins, whether it be Pharaoh Sanders, whether it be um, um, oh, so many other musicians who performed at the East. The East, this cultural institution, their probably most consistent, lasting legacy to this day to people who know about it is the African Street Festival in Brooklyn. Shout out to Baba Segun and Shabaka and all those folks in the East. But that's only the most visible. The children of the East and their children continue. They are many school teachers. I'm in conversation this week with teachers who are teaching the, Afri the AP African American History course, while the people who design a course, manage the training, all that, having a conversation, it's very important. I come in, you know, we do as Africans. We in a cipher. Where are you from? I'm so and so. Where you from? A so -so. couple of Nubians in there. Where y'all from? Are we talking? What? Hmm. Let me don't don't let me get started. Don't let me get started because then it will be anyway. We started talking, and how did we get almost immediately to? I said, wait a minute, you from where? Oh, so you remember the East? <laughs> Do I remember the East? We started talking. You know who's teaching this African American history course? I tell you who's telling teaching the African American history course. The African American history course is being taught by people who come out the East. Yeah, like these sisters here. Uh, Sister Shana, who I saw Henderson, uh, who's been now she's she's helping to train teachers. 
she came in last night, had the ox on. I'm like, see, this is my sister right here. She, you remember me? Of course I remember you. I saw you. We were together in February at the museum. We were talking. And before long, we in this whole conversation about the implications of teaching the AP African American Studies course for students who need IEPs, the individual education plans, those who might be in special ed or CPAD, as they call it. I mean, it's a very different thing. But these are teachers who have been teaching for a number of years who come out of cultural formations that didn't come out of the social structure or governance formations. So when you talk about what were, what were their aunts, what were their elders doing? They trying to create the new breed of black youth. African-American Students Association. You know, here are some of them as elders, revolutionary pioneers of the East. Adeyemi Bandele, yes. Shout out to his children, the Bandeles, who are still doing incredible work. Look, February 20th is Black Awareness Day, a memorial to al Haj Malik al-Shabazz, Malcolm X. This book is over 300 pages. You know, here are some of the sisters doing work, what they do now. East Sisterhood, don't even include the Ghana. They're in Ghana here. One of the Queen Mothers over there. Y'all stop lying on Queen Mother more in Vanity Fair. Anyway, talk about she ain't no pan Africanist or, or whatever you're trying to say. Here's some more pictures of the voices of the East Sisterhood. I'm just showing y'all a couple of random things. In a minute, I'm going to tell you. Uh, let's go to uh, Nana Bakan, who's in Brooklyn. Each person gets a page or two, and they write about what they've been doing since. They write about what they were doing when they were in their teens and 20s in the East. And they got the pictures. They got the documents. You see the stuff. there, And then they talk about, uh, here's uh, Mama Dara. She's in Brooklyn. Talking about some of these sisters are in Atlanta, which is where they had. Here's Sister Alberta, Mama Alberta, who's in Middleton, Florida. Voice of the e. These are some some of y'all know. In fact, I'm gonna look in the chat in a minute because I know some of y'all are talking about. Uh, if you want this book, by the way, um, it's forty bucks. But you can uh, you can email inquiry. I think it's uh, the East Family Fifty. So one word, the East Family Five Zero at gmail.com. So make the inquiry. And I would I would urge you to do that because see what this book, and this is what I said. Oh, by the way, the uh printer of the book, the publisher of the book, you already know. Paul Coates. Shout out to Black Classic Press. It's very important. I mean, it's not Princeton University Press where your master finally acknowledges that Africa is the origin of everything, but it's Black Classic Press. It's something we own. So, in other words, we ain't got to say, we just support. So, you know get this text because these are black women long distance runners for five decades who came into the formation very young and who have never stopped running but they're not running to resist oppression as their primary way they're running to be full human in the world and not as individuals but as part of community and as part of that community, that allows the resistance to take forms that those who oppress us can't see. Those who are in our communities who think that they should keep a cap on something. Well, we don't need to talk about that ancient African stuff or we don't need to talk about it. OK, that's fine. But you're going to have to have a training and you got to have somebody teach it. And it's going to be like Larry Miles or Sister Shania. They're going to show up and you ain't going to know where they came from unless you ask. But the reason you didn't ask is because you didn't come in here with a governance mentality. But those who did find each other very quickly, very quickly. And when they do come together, we revitalize ourselves, whether it be a blur con last week or out here at the decade uh, commemoration and marking of the 10 years of Black Lives Matter movement out in L.A., whether it be... Um, any of those things. This is how we build families for liberty. Now, if we want to take some of the resources, because now, I mean, this thing, as we know, is taking quantum leaps. Just like you left there Saturday on the way back to Jersey with bursting with ideas. I left there and said, okay, many of the things we've talked about in here that we've already taken steps for. Y'all see, it's like every week or every other week, I'm out in the streets. All right. We're going to say less about next summer because here's the thing. We know that wherever we go, I'm going to see a bunch of Nubians out there in California in a minute. We're taking, we're going to put a bunch of Nubians out there in Nile Valley in August. And guess what? I know some Nubians who are in the Nile Valley who are Nubians without a K and Nubians with a K in that swan. We're going to say less too, but you'll see. The point is this. As we connect physically, we may have started online just like Black Lives Matter did, but it very quickly began to emerge into the real work that people were doing and attract other people to that work. And if the conditions that created drill led to violence, 
from young people who don't want to be violent, but who feel like they have no choice. What do conditions that allow us to see that there are different choices to be made? What will that lead to? I think we're showing ourselves what that leads to every day. Someone pause there for a minute, prop, and see uh, a couple more things we want to. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of that. I'm sure it's an African adage, you know, uh, regarding the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Yes. And, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about the grace we don't have, mm. the conditions we've been forced into, the grace we don't have for one another. Um, and I've been guilty of this probably, of most, of my life, probably most of my life of judging mm. based on the the lack around them because you know we see the abundance and we say well why don't you just go to the library or why don't you just read a book or why why don't you surround yourself with better people why don't you just do better don't you see what it looks like to live better you don't have to live and you don't have to piss in the elevators you don't have to live in or among you know filth you don't have to do all of that but I also now because I'm in community because you know I'm doing deeper study because I found a greater understanding of myself I also understand and appreciate that there before the grace of God go I, right? That no question. That, oh, yeah. We all, we all, you know, we all come to a place at, at different times. And, you know, while we want to browbeat people for what they don't know, there was a time when you didn't know. And if no you question. always knew, then that's a, an extreme blessing. But, you know, most of us are walking around in abject I ignorance, including the mothers and daughters of liberty and the daughters of Confederacy and all of these racist folk out there. When I watch Tommy Tuberville or whatever the hell his name is, explain <laughs> white nationalism. And I, in that moment, understood that he didn't understand fully, but in his spirit, he just knows that his whiteness is something. He doesn't yes. even know why. He doesn't even know why that he's tied to it so much that it is a chain. Yes. That chain that those children are talking about in that music that I've never heard. That's the chain. It's the chain. And all of them. So I just, you know, I'm grateful that I'm free. Mm. And I guess in this freedom, I want everybody to experience it, you know, so that's the joy of it. And speaking of joy in the chat, she said it's F-R-Y day. Dr. Carr ushered in Friday because he's frying and cooking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I didn't want to fry. I was trying to be, I mean, do you know the sister? Uh, thank you. As a, no. And, and by the way, thank you, Brother Mills. Craig Mills made a point about drill music and the insurance companies taking out policies on the brothers and who make it into notoriety and when they are killed they can cash out i mean but but do you know the um but i didn't know it either prof i tell you what i knew drill you had to teach the hip-hop class in, you know in, in in the spring every semester at howard one of the hip-hop classes and this past year because um, you know when i think about you i don't think hip-hop you know even though i no, i know no. you have to deep deep you're not too old, but you know, yeah, I'm too old. You're probably 50. You were, you know, no, I'm too, I'm too old. I'm too old to, to be talking about hip hop. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, why, why do you teach that class? Because well, I, I started teaching in 2003 because they asked me to kiss one of the class. Uh, there were a couple of classes being taught at Howard, one in education. Uh, my sister Velma Lapointe, I think she did the first hip hop class. Howard has a long history. They they did hip hop concerts back in the late '80s. Uh, our friend April Silver, when she was an undergrad, when they were taking over buildings and creating Black Neo Force, her and Ras Baraka, they had the first hip hop conference anywhere. Uh, they had it at Howard for several years, and so you know, people said, "Well, will you?" I said, "Sure." I said, "It's going to be an Africana Studies class." What does that mean? That means we're going to spend the first few weeks on the framework, and then we're going to apply the framework to hip hop. So basically what that class that I've done is we go, we obviously start at Africa. We bring the modalities through cultural meaning making ways and all that. And then when we get to Jamaica, we use Jeff Chang's book, King Stop, Won't Stop, which I think is a good framework okay. in a way. Yeah. We start with the Caribbean and New York. We put the convergences in. And what you, we, you know this as well as I do. But now that you teach, the young people may have vaguely be aware of a Sugar Hill gang or the commercialization. They definitely don't ain't know about Sylvia Robinson. You know, they may know, you know, Nile Rogers, Rogers. Nile Rogers, no Rogers. question. So we go through all that cultural media making. As we talked about how, you know, Luther Vandross is the one that put, that told Nile Rogers in the studio. Vandross in there for something else. He just listened to Nile Rogers and them when he makes that lick 
doom, 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 which now Roger said he was mad because Grace Jones didn't invite them to Studio 54. They came down there. Grace Jones don't come to the door. They got to beg their way in. They can't get in. So he goes back to his apartment, got his base. Doom, 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 F Studio 54. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. And then, but then as he's doing it, Luther Vandross in there as they record what becomes, says Sheik, and he says, Luther Vandross trained as a singer too, saying, there's a little gap there. You need to put a little chant or something in there. So what do you do? Ah, uh, freak out. Do, 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 do. And Luther, right there. Say chic. Like, you know, Luther's the one. But the young people are like, what? Now, now y'all give me an example of how y'all do that. You know everybody want to be a damn rapper. So all these kids, half of them are hip-hop artists, underground. And this, some, this is where I come to. This spring, back in maybe March, this is when the black like HBC HBCU tours take place. The Chicago's People's Union and the Detroit kids, all they always come to my class. I, I got a strong connection. Karen Shropshire, who's a Nubian, all them, you know, they bring they've been bringing students from Atlanta for years. So the Atlanta kids come, the Detroit kids come, the, the Chicago the Chicago kids came that day. And I said, finally, okay, finally. I talk about this, but I'm too old for this. Somebody please explain drill music to me. So now I turn over to the 16 and 15 and 17 year olds and they start walking through this. And then there are students from Chicago and Howard, of course, like every HBCU. And I'm listening to this conversation. And what you realize is, even though you might know generally what it is, and you may go and chat a little sample, the effect that online has had on our young people, they, it, I will never cease. And I know you had this experience over and over again. I'll never cease to be stunned at the different world that we live in. We think we know who that kid is. And if they talk on one subject and then all of them are talking, all of a sudden you're the only one in the room don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> hey, what the hell just happened here? I thought I knew you all. It happens to me every day at Howard's campus if I stay there after the sun goes down. Yes. And it's yeah, like, I mean, I, 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 secretly is why I continue to teach because I don't want to be out of touch. You know, I no continue question. to teach because I, I need to be in touch. I need no I need that energy. I need to know what the hell is going on in this world. And I don't want to be one of those get off my lawn. I'm, at, I'm going to be get off my lawn, but I at least <laughs> want to have an understanding of what, what is going on in the world through their lens. And you can only do that in community, which is why, you know, when you, that one of the first classes, I think it was maybe in class lesson three or four, where I asked, you know, how did we learn? And you brought forth this, you know, image that in my mind still resonates, you know, mm -hmm. of an elder around a tree with all generations sitting mm -hmm. and sharing. That's the only way we can learn. And even as you're talking, I would love for you to do not hip hop, but music, because we started a journey with Cornell to we do Jimbies and Chorus to have kind of this breakdown of music, because I think that's the thing that ties everything together for us, that drum, that guitar, that, you know, that those lyrics, the way in which, because I'm super frustrated at the devolvement of music today, that, you know, uh, that, and, and that people who make music don't even know the history, don't even understand. I mean, the reason why Pharrell is so, you know, culturally relevant is because he can go to Marvin Gaye, bring in that this, oh, bring in that little, that little beat, Hey, 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 you know, and bring that into a <laughs> right, right, right. And, and we all we all are familiar with it of a certain generation, but the new generation now gets it in a like, oh, this is amazing. It was why Puffy was able to build Bad Boy off of the memory of Isley and Charlie and all of those groups, including Earth, Wind and Fire, and bring it back and forward <laughs> through Mary J. Blige, through all of this. And we it's the familiarity that we love. But now I feel like there's a missing piece because those same people who are in their 50s, right? Yes. Uh, the new crop of 20s and 30s, they don't really have the historical understanding. Their mothers and fathers aren't playing like mine did, Nina Simone and, mm. and Jerry Butler and, you know, mm. here, here in, you know, Teddy Pendergrass when he was with mm -hmm. Harold Melvin and didn't know who that voice was until, you know, he can But, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen because we're our music is so heavily curated it's not like saturday morning the record player is going and you're uh, you know seven eight nine having to clean the bathroom listening to Ooh. music of your mother you know that's not happening right so so, so you where did we why, get why, that? Did you, why did you why did you give the exact the exact same ritual that we were talking about yesterday I'm standing with Steve Birnbaum senior vice president college board really but and we stand around talking about what was your cleanup song? 
<laughs> because he played, oh, forget what he played. He was playing some, uh, uh, he was talking about Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, and Fire. And I said, my daddy's cleanup song was uh, LTD. He popped that eight track tape in there every time I move, I look and clean up the whole house. I said, what yeah. was y'all? And we was talking about cleanup songs. And why did you bring up the exact? Okay, so what were y'all cleanup songs, bro? Oh, my mother, you listen, first of all, uh, the blinds went up. <laughs> like eight, seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Like, it's like Saturday. Can I watch some cartoons? No, nope. you the lights in the house. Just Shut up, man. Shut up, man. get your ass up. <laughs> and it could be anything from Aretha to Stevie. I mean, it was just you know, but but those are memories that they stick with you for the rest of your life, but it's also kind of like it's nostalgia, it's 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 joy, even though part of the pain of having to clean up, but it also, <laughs> you know, it's the reason why you know how to clean, you no know, question. because again, the music got you through it, and then it would be dance breaks or what have you. That's I mean, right. my mother even like Tom Jones, so I'm just gonna say, you know, my music is eclectic, it's not a you it's, know uh, before it you. was a Carlton, I was I was inundated with damn I, Tom I heard Jones. You, I heard you shout out Depeche Mode. Yeah, well. <laughs> but you know what? But hey, we can we can give we can give a little peripheral extension to the Welshman from England, right? Because it's not unusual <laughs> to yeah. be loved by somebody. <laughs> so, I thought he was black with the curly hair. I ain't we know. All did. Hair, so you that's know. what I'm saying. If Paul Robeson discovered that a generation before them Welsh miners was adjacent to black people. Tom Jones was definitely somebody we we thought he was black. <laughs> But, so no. You know, I would I would love to bring that back just so that we can have music in in the future. <laughs> I, mean, it's okay. selfish. I just want to have some good music. And if, can we get can we get? I mean, because you know, if you think about even Michael and Prince and all of them were informed by pre. And you 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 know, looking at Jackie Wilson and and, and you're looking Ooh. at you know James Brown. And when you yeah. see those people, who yeah. are they looking at now? D Jason well, Derulo. I mean, who the hell? Who are they looking at? Well, they've gotten older. I mean, you know, and I think maybe, you know, Larie, we can ask, or in fact, we can just go straight uh, over there at Mega Evers. Of course, you know, Talib's mother is over there, as you know, Dr. Green, Brenda Green. I mean, listening to Talib Kwalisi, for example, sitting and talking with Black Thought, that generation is very clear, a quest love. I mean, that's all Mary Thompson talk about. But again, there's another, as you say, there's a generation after them, though. And so it's not at all clear as to how this momentum, remember the soul quarians, you know, the roots. I mean, the roots, going they're going to walk you through where they got stuff from. Yeah. And, and Questlove, he writing a book every six I months. Mean, but you, you're talking about Questlove and Talib, both of their parents. This is the point. Yeah, we're, we're educators. This I mean, high-level educators. So we, you know. In fact, you asked that, if you ask Talib about the East, he's going to talk about the women in this book. You're exactly right. <laughs> That's oh, it, Which led them to have a bookstore, him and, right. him, him and most deaf. That's right. So Cardi B don't have that, is my point. No. You know, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> you, you, you're right. You're right. I should mention when you mentioned Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, even Queen Latifah's mother was a teacher. No right? question. Let's... Oh, what? Chuck D. Chuck D's mother was oh, a cultural what? worker. In the thing. So when Chuck talks, he's not talking from scratch. No. He, didn't go, he didn't get that at Long Island University. He didn't get that. No, he went to school. His mom was in the Rock him. His auntie, <laughs> it's funny you mentioning this now. They're real, and I'm just saying that to say that sure, we definitely need to, to, to continue that. Cornell, like you say, with Carl and Urias, had those first couple of conversations. They're here for those of you who want to go and look and listen to those conversations. And I think that a lot of the Nubians are involved. We got Nubians in here who are producers who do the music stuff. I was in Atlanta with a couple of those brothers, uh, when we were down there with Baba Molly, and also we can get some people we're talking about. I mean, John Jennings came here and hung out with us and said, that's your friend? Oh, come on. We were talking about Octavia Butler. That's yeah. nowhere else. Yeah, I, got, I, I have a sickening Rolodex. I would say that. And the Rolodex yes, do. don't exist anymore. But, you know, I don't. I, I, I'm going to start pressing people to, mm -hmm. that, to, to, to lean in and stop. You know, I, yeah, I get the chase of the money. Money's good. It's important. We all, no need, you know. Uh, but at what point do you do you put the 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 mission in the building before the dollar? You know, and and that's got to be the question that I'm I'm gonna ask, and then we'll find out really quickly. You know, yes, uh, who's, who's about building? Because I'm gonna ask the question. So, yes, um, yeah, I want to see a, a generation from now, an Earth, Wind, and Fire, somebody with more Reese White's sensibilities to Ooh. usher in certain things and bring the elements into. You know, even Erica Badu was born underwater with three dollars and six dimes. Like she, come on now, understanding something. You you know what I'm saying, Doc? Shout, you know, out, shout like, out to the Pan African Connection Bookstore of Dallas, the South Dallas Cultural Center, because she too comes out of these people, many of whom were new. That's, that's exactly that's right. And that's that was, right. I remember that was special. You know, she shows up looking different no and she inspired a generation of what they call the dirty backpackers or whatever. But 
Or, 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 or the soul Aquarians. Common yes. is that. Common's yes. mother, and Reverend Wright tell you, Common's mother and Common members of Trinity United. Jeremiah Wright said Common would come to church, and after I finished my sermon, we would get a mic to him, and he would translate the whole thing into an improvised hip hop song right there in church. So, yeah, they came up. Common's mother is a principal. <laughs> and whatever we think about Kanye, Dr. Donda West. Come on, teach that. Uh, yes, very, very, very much involved in not just movement, but also uh, memory uh, mm. on a on a high level. So this this that that man uh, at his height, those those favorite albums of yours inspired, and very much by that same energy of knowledge. So yeah, whatever happened after, you know, we're not going to discuss. But now. I'm just saying we we owe it to the next generation to have the experiences that you and I are talking about right now with so much joy and glee and memories. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it can be revived, as you say, because it's still there. I mean, as you were talking, I'm thinking about that one of the collaborations that uh, Nas did with Kanye and thinking about the fact that Nas is father. Oh, Nas. Nas is dead. Yes. All those books in, the, yes. in, the, in the, him and his brother reading those books. Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark. I mean, this is really, we should do this, huh, Prof? Yeah, yeah. I want, I want to do this. I want to do this, Dr. Wow. Dr. Clark. I think, I think it's necessary. As much as even the inspiration that we got, and that's going to get that's gonna get done. And, um, you know, but again, I'm going to invite, because the invitation is nice, those of you who are inclined, who are excellent, because that's the other thing. I feel like we we've lost the discipline of what it looks like to sit in something long enough to be expert at it, right? Because yeah, we all that's are, true. you know, uh, doing drive-bys on all of the things. But no, that's like, true. What, 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 Mario, after it. what Mario's doing in Nubia, I'm telling you, there's nowhere in the planet. It's not at Sorbonne. It's not at Harvard. It's not at Oxford. They're not teaching meta nature. First of all, they can't teach the way he teaches it. Second of all, they would never dream of making it available so that everybody can do it. Third of all, and in fact, I want to mention this problem. Don't go anywhere. I just, I, I had a, uh, oh man, I thought I had the, oh, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep looking until I find it. I mentioned this to you when I when I read it. We were talking on um uh, on Tuesday. It's Tuesday. There's an article in Tuesday's New York Times, Ro Romy Crawford. Romy Crawford, I'm going to do this very quickly. Romy Crawford, who is at the new art school modality, she's creating something, helping with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. It's called the New Art School Modality. Here's the article. As art colleges close, a museum has an idea. Romy Crawford, very interesting figure. I got several of her books. She did a good one on the, the, the wall of respect and connecting. Anyway, Black Arts Movement figure coming organically out of that movement, by the way. But here's the thing. The Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago and the educator Romy Crawford have become partners in a new program that focuses on pairing instruction by artists of color uh, with hands-on learning by students working alongside them. This intensive semester-long course, which its founders announced on Monday, is called the New Art School Modality and will start in September at the museum. Now watch this. Traditional models of art education have become increasingly endangered as trusted schools, trusted like uh, your master, I'm sorry, Christopher I mean, is trusted. Trusted, I, I guess, will we be trusted? We trust ourselves. Anyway, uh, as trusted schools from the San Francisco Art Institute to the Watkins College of Art in Nashville. Now, it's in Nashville. I ain't never even been to the Watson College, and I grew up in anyway. Have fallen into bankruptcy oop, or merged with larger institutions. These developments have gotten the attention of some leaders in the art world who are now financing alternative modes of instruction that sidestep degree granting programs altogether. Let's make this point together, y'all. You need resources. That's why we have a subscription base in narrative. It isn't oppressive. It isn't exorbitant, but it's enough to get the platform up and manage it and keep it going. This is the Carter Woodson model. Now, the art schools are terrified. Why? People not coming to art school no more. They got this huge overhead, the museums. So the, what are they doing? They got to go out and beg some philanthropists or get some. And of course, when you start begging philanthropists, that's when the right wing on Christian soldier types come in. For example, everybody buying their drawers and soap at Walmart, you know that they got one of the best art collections in the world now. It's in Crystal Bridges, Arkansas. Because right? mm -hmm. they can buy all the stuff, right? They tried to buy the stuff from Fisk. Fisk eventually, you know, playing big bank, take little bank engaged in a partnership. But my point is this, these art schools now are saying, let's bring people in, put them with practitioners. They all learn together. What do you get from it? You get the knowledge. We are going to eschew degree granting programs altogether. Guess what? 
we already doing that, except we're not even finished. We just getting started because maybe we'll have some partnerships with universities and other institutions. Our licensure may be completely internal. The, the value of what's being done here outstrips the value of what they're doing at the university anyway. And let me end with this. Let me see if I can find the quote here, because here's the other thing. She's been partnering with our brother, Theaster Gates, talks about that, talks about next semester, the focus is going to be on Fest Tax 77, the Pan-African Convening of Black Artists, artists in Lagos. We Here it is. Two years ago, she organized an exhibition about the festival with the artist Theasta Gates, but she hopes students will deepen their knowledge through exposure to the photographer Roy Lewis and the painter Gerard Williams, who attended the original exhibition nearly 50 years ago. I just saw Roy at Randall Robinson's uh, uh, memorial. Roy Lewis here in D.C., Roy, Roy Lewis worked for Mr. Johnson for Ebony for many years. Roy Lewis was at the fight with Ali's fight with Frazier in Kinshasa. He was at Festat. They're going to bring him in and they're going to pay him. But my point is this. She's they're developing a thing that watch this. According to educators, traditional art schools are struggling to recruit students who question whether a fine arts degree is worth the high tuition cost. The closures have predominantly been about schools relying too much on tuition and not considering if students could afford it, said the art historian Karina Kirsch, who taught at the San Francisco Art Institute before it closed. Kirsch said that the alternative approaches like the one in Chicago could offer the kind of diverse programming without artists of color that universities have been slow to, de to devise. But these courses would not fully replace the need for a fine arts degree, which she says she viewed as a pathway toward critical thinking. Crawford said her program has somewhat different goals. See, here's what the art schools and the universities trying to preserve their existence. It's the Wizard of Oz thing. Scarecrow, you got a brain, but what you don't have is what? This rolled up piece of paper, a degree. Why? So why do I need a degree if I know what I'm talking about? Because we use the degree to keep ourselves relevant and keep ourselves in the thing. We're we jailbroken that. Last paragraph. Crawford said her program has somewhat different goals. This almost sounds like Nubia. There's intentionality, there's intentionally less hand-holding, and the art school apparatus is reduced, she said. Well, we've eliminated the need, she said, adding that she wanted students to create projects that, quote, live in the world rather than course credit. Oh, well, come see us. Come see us, Professor Crawford. Come see us over here. Do you remember? Do you remember? And by the way, I, I want to mention that since you mentioned uh, Mama Nia sold us these books too. This is Trenton Bailey's new book. Bailey, I don't think any relations. He's from. He from looks America. like he looks like Philip Bailey. You sure? Uh, what? Well, that's oh, Philip that's Bailey right there on the cover. That's, that's, that's literally Philip. There's a Nubian. No, a Nubian. A yeah. Nubian. A no. Hey, look, look. When we was in hard lockdown and the whole world was in here every week, I mean, to have Philip Bailey say, "Come on, brother. Come on." Mm. But do you remember celebrating fifty years of Earth, Wind, and Fire? This book just came out. Trenton Bailey's book. Uh, he is a professor. In the Clark in the Nanny University Center, he's taught at Morehouse, Clark, Atlanta. He thanks Pop Norman in the acknowledgement. So, uh, Baba Omo, Dr. Black, uh, I'm sure you know this brother. I'm sure I know him too. I got to run into him. But Mama Nia had these fresh off the press when we were in her store a couple of weeks ago. So, do you? And, it, and it's excellent because he he walks through all that history when they were known as the Pharaohs. You know, all this Egyptian stuff, in Earth, Wind, and Fire was intentional, as we know. But he 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 does a great job on that book. So, well, um. Nubians bringing their brick. Uh, Sherry Perry has a Nubia playlist. Oh, so we'll we'll share that. Uh, I'll share that in the description here. They put their work songs in the chat. Yeah, I love Damn it. Cool. I love it. I love it. And, and also, I just wanted to let you know, I had to dip out of Meta Nature um, after the first few weeks because it is study that you have to sit with, and because you know I, I have fifty eleven things going on, I didn't want to you know, do a drive-by on it. But while y'all are in Nubia, uh, in Kemet, I, um, I'm making a commitment this summer to go through, try to get through all of Dr. Beatty's lessons because I remember the first few lessons, it being something that I didn't expect, you know, uh, in terms of a spiritual understanding and awakening. Like the drawing of the glyphs did something to me that I didn't expect. Yeah. And I want to get back to that. And, and for centering, and if you are going through anything in your life where you just need, when we're talking about focus and you just need to, to sit with yourself, 
taking Dr. Beatty's Metanetra class will, will center you in a way that I don't think any of you uh, will expect. So I want to thank you again for the introduction. Uh, Dr. Beatty is, is all of the things. And I recognize that. And every, every week I'm like, Oh, I'm missing, I'm missing. I'm missing. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but the beauty, and I was going to say, even my anxiety, cause I, I know a lot of us have anxiety. We're at 175 and some of you have only seen 10, you know, some of you, you know, have only seen, you know, a handful but we're there, for, and I keep saying, there's, there's at your own pace. We're gonna be here forever. This is here forever. Ever. So you can take, you know, have long if it takes you fifty years to go through one hundred and seventy-five, uh, or wherever. By the time you get there, it'll probably be a lot more. But you know, it, take take your time. Take your take time. We're not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah, take your time. Because all those lessons are live. They live on the platform. They live. And, and you can't you can't master metanetch as Egyptians say that the limits of one's craft are not reached, but this, the feeling you had is the exact same feeling I had when Dr. Obengo was teaching us, Roosevelt Roberts was teaching us, Jake Carruthers was teaching us. When you start drawing them, you realize, wait, you first of all, you can't hurry it, do it. You got to be slow. Like you say, it's coming through your fingers. And as you begin to understand just the, the, the very basic, which are the building blocks, the, the vowels, the soft consonants, and then you get a word and you're drawing that bird or you're drawing that loaf. And it's like, and this is this is the exact words that I remember. I never forget. I told Rose. I said, "It's like they're talking to you." He said, "No, it's not like they're talking to you, brother. They are. T these are your ancestors now talking to you. That is the experience. It's a very spiritual experience. You're not just right. It's not like you're using the 26 characters of, of the alphabet for sounds. No, these are concepts. We're drawing. And as you're doing it, you're you're beginning to realize two things. One, you know why they chose this bird." They chose this low. They chose this twisted flax. And the second thing is, you would have made the same decision. At that point, you are your ancestors. Yes. <laughs> it is, it is indescribable. We, we have eliminated cursive writing from school, right? Mm -hmm. and in many ways, that has um, done something deleteriously yes. to, to, to uh, young people's ability to connect with things and it's wild that you would think something so simple i don't know who makes th these arbitrary decisions to remove phonics and to remove you know these these you know cursive writing there was something about pen to paper yeah something in the development of a child right yes. and we eliminated because somehow now everything's digital but you know they got you know very muscular thumbs but their minds aren't as muscular right so so now you add the meta nature which is cursive but then history and then spirit, and now you have something completely wholesome. That's right. That yeah. it, it, even for if, so, those of you who are in Nubia with young children this summer, since you know that three month gap, two and a half month gap seems to be a problem in terms Ooh. of back up in September. I'm going to encourage you to do what I'm doing, which is to have your 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 young people, no matter what their age, My God. Sit, start with lesson one. In in Meta Nature and go through Dr. Beatty this summer. Uh, Dr. Ooh, that's powerful. Yeah, I think that's, that's powerful. Let, let me add because this is unanticipated. This yeah, but, you know, the last thirty minutes we just talked. No, no, we talked. I mean, but this is so this is so powerful because you know one of the things that and again I'm I I you know I wouldn't recommend you buy Christopher Arrett. I'm gonna buy because I have to. That's my job. I mean, I'm I'm one of those few people like when we're going to talk about blocks and then we, we need to have the thing so that we can have the thing. I don't get books. So I had the books. No, And we're moving toward that as well. We, we're going to have that physical institution where we all do that. And then, and then we just take another quantum leap. But but Eret talks about the fact that when when different groups of people meet. The people who have the better ideas that will help the other people, those ideas tend to then populate those other people and they pick up those ideas. That's cultural diffusion. You don't pick up the bad ideas. You pick up the good ones. He said, if you want to understand ancient Egypt, you have to understand this isn't a society in one little part of Africa. They came out of Ethiopia, what is now Ethiopia. They came out of what is now Sudan. And as the thing expanded, they came out of what is now the Sahara, but was grassland. These are different groups of Africans. And he's very clear, these are Africans who are having influence on each other. So by the time you get to the pyramid stuff, that's, that's, that's 20,000 years of conversations, debates, choices. It is a high level of common thinking. Now let's think about that. The period between the 
early pyramids, and we, I think we're going to talk more about this. I think we might want to do maybe some time on this before we go to the Nile Valley, even in here. 2700 BC or so, and what you call, what we call Cleopatra, the Ptolemies, which is not even something we need to be talking about, but let's just for sake of argument, They're about around maybe 300, 330 BCE. That's 2400 years. If we went from 20, 2023, where we are now, and went back 2400 years, we're now Alexander. We blew past Jesus. It's 300 years before Jesus comes. So oh, now yeah. take that and do it times five. And you're talking about Egypt. Why y'all study ancient Egypt? It's no threat. Boy, be quiet. Do you understand how long people been having conversations to develop the better thing? And this is why I'm going to don't, don't go anywhere. I just want to read this quick thing from Eret because I respect Christopher Eret. My problem with Eret is he don't respect me. I respect Iraq. He don't respect you, Professor Hunter. He doesn't respect us. Meaning what? You are well aware. You've been at conferences. You've been in conversations with these Africans who've been saying this, but you need to be the authority, just like these art schools need to keep charging tuition. And then we got black people like Henry Gates who are trying to help black people too. But you think you're going to help black people by cherry picking the white dudes and so that you can maintain your state. Look, bro, go with God. I ain't mad at you. You've done some incredible work. I read your work. I don't have any problem with you. I'm saying that we're doing something else. This is what Eret writes. He says, he says, one particularly powerful set of resources then allows us to propose correlations of linguistic history with that with datable archaeology. In other he, words, he's saying once we begin to understand languages, we can then go look for the material evidence of who these people were. This is very Western. This is not what you just talked about, Professor Hunter. We ain't got to go get shovels to go dig around to find some artifacts to prove we black people to anybody. All we got to do is sit with the language and who we are in terms of ways of knowing, who we've been in terms of our movement and memory and culture meaning making. As we begin to learn the language, it 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 unblocks the arteries because we're not coming to us. What are you saying? Black people have a natural affinity? No, what I'm saying is that them clean up songs that you've been singing, when you start talking about the lyrics of those songs and you start translating Medu Nature, you're going to see cultural concepts that line up with Earth, Wind, and Fire, with Harold Melvin and the Blue Note. If you want to understand Harold Melvin and the Blue Note, Teddy Pendergrass singing, I Miss You, your best bet is to translate some language, some love letters from the 19th dynasty. And you're going to say, damn, these are Africans. We're not trying to prove them to nobody. But this is where he goes with it. He says, what does he say? He says, the words used in those ancient languages serve as a robust cultural archive. They tell us what the people who spoke these languages possessed, practiced, knew, and believed. Eret writes, if speakers of an ancient language had words for a particular thing or a particular activity, then at the very least they knew about the thing or activity connoted by these words. If we can reconstruct whole suites of words relating to particular cultural objects and activities, we know that these objects and activities were lively parts of their cultures. Brother West, I understand why you like democracy. You studied Greek, you studied Near Eastern languages. If you'd studied Medinetia, you would have learned about my eye, and you'll never say the word democracy again. But I understand why. <laughs> anyway, so let me. Let me. <laughs> and, then, and again, like, you know, don't be offended by what you don't know. Right. You know, no. Like, embrace the knowledge and be and and do better and change it's okay change is good as octavia but change is god actually. change is god that's she what she said, said. Yeah. john clark said don't get mad get smart don't get mad get smart and it's here we did it you look setting this up people say oh you know well you gotta pay to get no you gotta somebody gotta keep the lights on somebody gotta pay the bills you got a mind for that too which is inestimately valuable Cause that's not what I think, but you can see it all. It, it comes it, with sacrifice. It comes with sacrifice. Oh, People, huge sacrifice. You know, so I'm not gonna let anybody, you know, besmirch or or question anything. You know, as somebody that has. Anyway, I won't. I won't get into it. But you know, yeah. it's uh, you know, it's long. It's a long game, right? We want to be here forever. Game. What does that look like? We want to be here forever, not asking anybody for a damn thing. How about that's that? Right. That's you, right. You know, so if if you gotta, you know, chip in hundred fifty dollars, that's not even a tie. That's you know what I'm saying? Are you kidding no. me? Like, y'all spend more than that on sneakers. How Come about on. that? Let's and go. For everything here and for the thing that. And, and if we you want to me. build something out for children? Like, what What, what are we doing? What Come is on. this valuable? This Come goes on. back. Is this valuable? And if it is valuable, 
Let's go. Let's go. Like, come on. And, and, when, and when your child shows up with a design for sneakers that makes you a billion dollars because she was sitting in the in narrative and Nubia taking it and got a spark with an idea and combine, then you're gonna say, Well, damn. Now at that point, you should probably you know make a donation, yeah, but we can <laughs> get there too. Come this, on with something. Yeah, come on. All right. Well, Dr. Carr, listen, let me say one other thing before I let you go. No, no, no. Don't move. Don't move. I just want to very quickly because to to this point of what happens when you have institutions and what happens when you don't. uh, The 14th of July, uh, 1905, is when Andrew Carnegie, who had donated about five million dollars, I guess, and they uh, no about five million dollars in those dollars. he, He told New York to build all these libraries. And the one they built on 135th Street was the 133. 135th Street uh, Division, which became the Negro Division, it was opened on the 14th of July, 1905. About 30 years later, uh, a brother uh, sold his black collection to the 135th Street Library, and they made him the curator of his collection. That, of course, would be the great Afro-Puerto Rican Arturo Schomburg. And then after him, Lawrence Reddick, and then, of course, Dorothy uh, 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 Jean Blackwell Hudson and all the great librarians there. But I'm just mentioning that because today then would technically be July 14th, uh, 1905, the day that Schomburg was created. And of course, Schomburg didn't donate his books because he needed a job. He sold his books, about 5,000 of them, for $10,000 to the 135th Street Library, to New York Public Library. And now the Schomburg is one of our major research institutions. But here we have in Nubia and Narrative, we also are building a major research institution. And this is one that begins life with us, for us, by us, to the world. And we are an extension. What does the Schomburg look like in the 21st century? You're in it. Come on. (laughs) You're in it. So 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 love you. Love you too. Safe travels. Yes. And uh, Nubians, you know what we do out there in them streets. No question. uh, Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you, Professor Hunter. Love you. Love y'all. See ya. All right. And I'll see everyone uh, tonight, today uh, on my show. If you are a part of Sirius XM and join Sirius XM, I think there's a link on the on my uh, homepage where you can get like three months for free. Come on in. These clips, these are just clips, except for in class with car. That might be the whole thing. But these are just clips of a three hour Monday through Friday show. That's fire. Not because of me, because I have great guests and callers and people. But uh, love everyone. See you in them streets. God bless.